We're back. Welcome to All in the Field, AWS Agriculture Live. Karen, what are we talking about today? A cattle ear tag and a climate challenge. How are those two things connected? Ah, uh, this is a trick question. They're connected in space. Absolutely. So we're going from low Earth orbit all the way down under to have our guests from Cirrus Tag share uh, what they're working on all the way from Australia. So stick around for our Cows in Space episode of All in the Field. AWS Agriculture Live. Great. Thanks for joining us, Rachel and I, today as we uh, go through our Cows in Space episode. I am Karen Hildebrand. I am the worldwide tech leader for the agriculture industry segment, meaning I get to work with all of our very cool agricultural customers and the innovations that they're building. And I'm a fourth generation farmer myself, a doctorate in AIML, and really excited to see the solutions and the customers that we get to talk to every episode. And I'm Rachel Bradshaw. I'm a go-to-market specialist for IoT, and I lead the agriculture vertical for our IoT services. I have a passion for food, a specialization in connectivity and IoT enablement, a title that obviously makes Karen jealous, and puns that do not. <laughs> That's not true. I really actually cannot wait to see what you come up with today for an episode about cows in space. Well, you know, Karen, I utterly adore talking about cows in space. Wow, that was that was pretty bad. <laughs> that was bad. Would would you say I butchered it? I'll tell you what, oh. I won't <laughs> milk this conversation any longer. Let's just put a stake on it until I come up with something more moving for you. Wow, that was a whole lot of bad, all wrapped up into one little sentence. All right, so I think I'm that means we should just move straight into the field notes. Sounds good. <laughs> All right. All right. So <laughs> let's see what else you come up with today. Um, but Rachel, working in IoT and agriculture, I know connectivity is a conversation that we have with our customers all the time. So we wanted to cover in the field notes section what low Earth orbit satellites are. Absolutely. So IoT devices bring in more data by being embedded in the, the devices, but the I stands for internet, which ultimately means that at some point the device needs to connect to the internet. Right. And there's the ability for edge computing and there is a solutions for intermittent connectivity like AWS IoT Greengrass. Um, but if I always need a connected device, I need something like satellite, right? Right, certainly. It's a great option. In the past, satellites have been very expensive to launch, which means very expensive to access. Um, a few years ago at reInvent, AWS announced its first foray into space with AWS Ground Station, which is a fully managed service that lets you control satellite communications, process data, and scale your operations without having to worry about building or managing your own ground station infrastructure. Absolutely. And immediate data processing is exactly what you need for IoT devices and AWS Ground Station enables that for customers. Um, AWS Ground Station uh, provides the satellite antennas in close proximity to AWS infrastructure uh, regions, which give you that low latency and low cost access to AWS services um, to store and process your data. And that really allows you to reduce um, your analysis time for use cases like weather prediction and natural disaster uh, imagery from hours to minutes or even to seconds. Right. So now that we have the foundation of space for both connectivity and downlinking of data, let's hear about what's possible directly from a customer. It's like when you see a commercial for an amazing new food to try versus hearing about it from a friend. You're always going to trust your friend over that commercial, right? It's a lot more real. So Karen, who are we meeting today? Well, I first serious tag founder David and Melissa through their chief operating officers for us. And what impressed me the most in the conversation 
what asking for us to solve for them. Instead, Dick popped up immediately and he got up the ear today and asked Peter, and he really showed me how it actually worked. And arm and having done the tagging myself, I always have used two hands to get the, uh, the applicators actually closed. And so David said, exactly, and that's why we've designed the hardware so that it's easy to use. And we started with that uh, customer's problem in mind. Those are the best conversations. And I, it might just be me, Karen, but you were cutting out a little bit. But if I heard you correctly, uh, I think you were saying that you met Lewis Frost through David and Melita um, and that you know personally how hard it is to tag cows. You had to always use two hands. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what you're saying. Um, <laughs> and so you can really understand the problem. And I know I really understand the problem from talking to customers. I, I think we might have lost Karen, but um, we are looking forward to bringing on our guest, Lewis, on the show to talk about how Sirius Tag approach cattle tags differently and how they're now bringing to market their satellite connected ear tag that solves so many challenges in livestock management. So, Lewis, welcome to On the Field. Thank you so much. I know it's early for you. Uh, it is early. Good morning, and thanks for having me. So Lewis, I know this is a crazy time of day to be joining us from Australia. Again, I can't thank you enough for taking the time. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about Sarah's tag? Certainly. Um, so look, for about the last 15 years, I've been working to bring a range of different technologies to the livestock industries around the world. So this includes things like um, genomics, molecular like diagnostics, and more recently, smart tags, wearables, and IoT. Mainly, this has been in domesticated livestock, so beef and dairy cattle is sort of my, my speciality, but also some work in companion animals, including uh, domestic cats and dogs and, and pets. Now at Sarah's Tag, I've been here for a little over a year and a half. Uh, the team has been able to produce the world's first director satellite smart ear tag and more importantly, associated data platform for livestock. And we're really working uh, through this, this system to bring remote animal monitoring to the entire supply chain. Very cool. So what is the big problem you were able to solve with satellite connectivity? What does it mean for those of us back here on Earth wanting to manage a herd? So the power of satellite has really come to us thanks to our communication partners at Global Star. And with their help, we've been making this kind of smart tag solution ubiquitous and accessible to all. Uh, they've provided us with what's called a constellation of 36 low Earth orbit satellites. And what that means for the end user is full-time, 24-7, 365, worldwide coverage and, and reception. So with traditional smart tag systems, as you'll know, you need to create a local uh, network, usually a wireless network, using a, a range of different technologies and protocols. But that requires someone visiting your farm, uh, surveying the land, and installing uh, very expensive antennas, relay stations, and, and base stations, making it not a very simple process to adopt the technology at all. With our system, it's as simple as taking a tag. Here's one of the small tags that we use on livestock. Taking our applicator that Karen was talking about, a very ergonomic device, and simply popping the tag in the applicator. And that flashing red light on the front through the light pipe tells us this tag is now uh, been activated and is seeking a connection to the satellite. Then it's as simple as applying the tag to the animal and the data starts to flow within uh, a matter of hours. That's, that's what satellite really means for the end user. All right, so we, we just talked obviously about the tag itself and sorry that my uh, voice dropped out there, obviously uh, the joys of an agriculture episode. Um, but we did just talk a little bit about how it was developed and Cirrus Chag has been phenomenally effective at developing strategic relationships. Uh, um, and when we talk about CSIRO, which is the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Org, uh, it's been very innovative in agriculture. We see their fingerprints on a lot of different uh, capabilities from crop phenophasing, obviously, all the way to hardware development. Can you tell us a little bit about that partnership? 
Yeah, so I mean, just as we sought out AWS to engage and, and really come together to deliver something fantastic that I think we're going to hear a little bit more about later on in the show, David and Melita Smith, the, the founders of Sarah's Tag, sought out CSIRO after they came across a, a small piece of work they'd done in the past relating to remote animal monitoring. And we really came together with, with CSIRO and their digital sciences arm, Data61, to sort of align ourselves around some big, hairy, audacious goals about what we thought could possibly be achieved in remote animal monitoring and, and making it really accessible uh, for, for a, a worldwide users. And I think we've been really lucky and that's a common thread in the way we approach partnering. We're very open. We, we have an open platform, both sort of literally and figuratively in the way that we engage. And we tend to find partners who align themselves in a similar way to the problems and, and nuts that we're trying to crack. Within the industry, so sort of beyond research and development, thinking a little more commercially or, or out there engaging with, with stakeholders and, and customers, we know that we have to connect and we have to share some of our value up and down the supply chain from where our, our tags are deployed to ensure that everyone in that supply network uh, benefits. And with CSIRO in particular, we've been really lucky that they've seen it exactly the same way. So it's been a great partnership. That's really interesting. I mean, and just seeing the tags and how easy and quick it is to get the setup. I feel like I could even do it and I've never tagged cattle before in my life. Uh, Lewis, I'd like to bring on one of your colleagues, Heidi Parrott, who's the data platform manager. Let's go ahead and bring her in. Hey, Heidi. Oh, I think you're muted. Let's try again. Can oh nope, no, we can't hear you yet. <laughs> we'll give you another second to unmute or or refresh if you need to. So we'll just wait for Heidi to come back. It will just be one second, I'm sure. Oh, are you there, Heidi? Hear me now. Yes, no, we, can. we can. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thanks very much. Glad to be here. Well, before I hammer you with questions, why don't you just introduce yourself, let us know a little bit of your background and how you're tied to agriculture. Sure. So uh, I have a technical background. I started off as a research software engineer uh, and then I moved into the security space where for several years I managed and ran a secure air gapped facility for criminology and social analytics uh, before uh, going to work as the data innovation program manager for the Queensland Cyber Infrastructure Foundation here in Australia. But um, similarly to um, Karen, I was born and raised on a cattle property in central Queensland and um, I was thrown on a horse before I could barely walk and have since spent many long hours in my childhood leading or tailing out cattle and working in hot, dusty cattle yards, drafting, vaccinating or tracking. So when I talked to David and Melita about Sarah's tag, I knew they were onto a good thing. Oh, that's great. Now, I have a question that I'm going to pose to both you and Lewis, and that is, you have worked with PwC to quantify the potential value of the tag in terms of the problem it solves. Can you tell us two to three use cases that have really excited you? Let's start with Lewis and then maybe we'll we'll turn it over to Heidi. So two to three, that, that's that's really challenging. There's, there's so many to choose from. I mean, I think as you just heard, Heidi's on-farm credentials definitely outshine mine. So I might focus on some sort of whole of life supply chain uh, pieces and leave the, the on-farm application to Heidi in just a minute. Um, the, the tag is not a removable device, just to set the scene a little bit. When we apply a device to an animal, it stays with that animal for its life and, and travels with it on its journey through that network. So it's amazing to see the tag become this golden thread of data that connects all these disparate data points and data sets as an animal moves from one owner to, to another across its entire life. And that means we can dig into some really interesting use cases. 
currently we're working with a partner of ours in, in Western Australia who's looking at uh, carbon management. So this is where they want to use the tags to specifically monitor animal behavior like grazing, uh, where they rest, rumination, how they move around, and actually automate the process for applying for carbon credit units, which means the producer could get a return in real dollar terms uh, on the investment in technology, which is, is really exciting. And we can also combine this with looking at uh, greenhouse gas emission monitoring or, or reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And we're doing this through a new technology package we've accessed thanks to our partners at CSIRO called eGrazer, which allows us to remotely monitor individual uh, feed intake for animals in, in pasture outside of a feedlot environment. So we can start to understand which animals eat more or, or less and which animals are more or less uh, efficient than others. So over time, we can actually drive that efficiency into those groups of animals and reduce the greenhouse gas emissions for the entire supply chain. Uh, you said two to three, I'll, I'll do just one more. And I think that would have to be animal welfare. So through monitoring animal health and, and being able to observe when an animal is in distress or under duress, we start to build up a lifetime passport of animal welfare for, for that individual animal. And now we can look holistically at how an animal has been treated throughout its life. And some of our partners are working on new and exciting ways to actually communicate that uh, to the consumer at, at the end of that supply chain. So that, that's enough from me. I'm going to throw to Heidi for the, the Beyond Farm applications. Thanks, Lewis. So having grown up on a cattle property, um, I see a big value in the farmer knowing where their cattle are throughout the day. Uh, there are some properties in Australia, to give you context, um, and remote, so large and remote that they have to employ a pilot full time. So the fact that Sarah's tag provides geolocation of individual animals throughout the day is a huge wow. thing. Um, you can know where the cattle are before you go and do that muster that might take a week or more. Um, you can also find a pilot. When you say a pilot, Heidi, I just want to pause you. You mean a helicopter pilot, right? A helicopter or so fixed wing or or not. So it could it could yeah. actually be um, a helicopter or uh, a, a small plane that's used to go and locate the animals. Thanks. Thanks. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess um, being able to know where your animals are and then um, what health condition they're in without actually having to go and eyeball them can be quite valuable um, in that instance. Uh, you can also potentially uh, find the cattle who uh, hide in the scrub. Um, another part of the solution that really excites me though is the data. Uh, data is quite close to my heart. So while the information sent is small, it is quite powerful. Uh, in terms of mustering, you can find out information about individuals like this uh, video we have here. There's also the ability with the Sarah's tag to get sent alerts or event driven packets um, for things like animal theft or breakout. For example, if your prize bull start, suddenly starts moving at 60 kilometers an hour, you might want to look into it or enter him into the Bull Olympics. Um, health and distress can be detected using the on tag accelerometer. Um, and we also have the ability um, with software providers to show pasture utilization. So this is important for farmers over time, seeing how individuals move around a paddock um, as an individual and as a mob can help give insight into how your pasture is being used. Yeah, that's really impactful, especially knowing when they are moving together or when one actually separates from the rest of the herd, right? So, so many insights. I love that part of the platform because I can see immediately how, you know, it would have been helpful back when, you know, I was still on the on the beef part of the operation. So that'd be really interesting to me. Um, so let's dive a little bit deeper, Heidi, into the technology. Um, I always ask for architecture diagrams. You were happy to uh, bring one along. Um, and 
again, David Melita, the Sears Tag team has really collaborated uh, really closely to create reusable assets. So for the rest of you that are wanting to read a little bit more about the architecture, there's a blog that was just published about this. Nathan's going to drop it in the chat for you to be able to reference it after the show. Um, so you can dive a little bit deeper into the architecture there. But Heidi, why don't you walk us through it? We'd really love to kind of hear how you put this together. Sure. Okay, so it's quite a dense diagram, but I'll start at the bottom of the diagram here. Uh, so this relates to how the data gets from the tag into our IoT database synapse. Uh, the data is sent from the tag to one of Global Star's low or Earth orbit satellites. And from here, it's retrieved by the ground station and parsed and ingested into our IoT streaming database synapse. Um, the data is then held there and then when requested by the Ceres Tag Management System or CTMS, it's sent through along with other contextual information to the end user. Um, from, so yeah, so from here um, in this other part of the diagram, uh, this forms the central part of our data platform. It is quite tense, so I'll just take you through some of the key parts. Um, it was important for us to use AWS's encrypted at rest RDS to hold our data. Uh, because we're making a lot of use of APIs and holding data from different systems, the secure storage of our data was a very key component. Uh, also making good use of the Cognito authentication system here to make sure all of our transactions are authenticated. And we wanted to make, the, make use of the flexibility gained to us by using the ECS cluster and the application load balancer. So that's a bit of a look under the hood of the CTMS. Now I'd like to quickly show you through the external interfaces. As you can see here, there's a number of APIs and authentication points. Because we are, for want of a better word, a plug and play smart tag, uh, so we have no additional infrastructure required as Lewis mentioned earlier, we're using an e-commerce platform for ordering. And once key information is captured throughout the manufacturing, it can then be passed on to the tag owner. The tag owner views the data through a software solution. Now, we're not a software solution, we're a data provider. So we have an API that our software partners can authenticate against to pull tag, tag data into their software and visualize the data in a more user-friendly, meaningful way, perhaps using analytics um, and number crunching. The tag owner chooses a software they view the data through. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, before I go on, I want to know how I get invited to the Bull Olympics because I do want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you've also hit on a key thing that a lot of our customers talk about, and that's really critical about how you built your customer tag management system to be interoperable with other platforms. Can you tell us a little bit about the herd management system integrations? Sure. Uh, so as a data provider, we're partnering with established and developing software companies. Uh, we've worked on making the software integration as easy as possible using well-known standard practices to, with a view to enrich the data offered to farmers. We're doing this using an authenticated RESTful web API, mostly, which allows us to talk to any number of other solutions out there in a standard way without having to be concerned about the other systems set up. Uh, after a software provider is authenticated, they're able to ingest the tag data and display it for our customers. And to get them started, we're generating a synthetic data set with a sample endpoint so that once they're configured and set up and we've um, done a lot of troubleshooting, then we can switch them over to the live endpoint. So we're, we're really trying to lift the ecosystem as a whole here and collaborate with as many uh, software providers as we can. 
That's fantastic. I know one of the other things that we talked about when we're having conversations is really how are you designing for the global scale uh, of your deployments as well as the global scale of where the herd is. And so um, I just wanted to say just a, you've done a bang up job on your architecture. Uh, we really like to see the things that you are employing in order to be able to be ready to scale quickly with Amazon CloudFront and Amazon Ramp 53 and being ready with your app application load balancers, all of those are really uh, great architectural design patterns. Um, but we know that you evaluated other cloud providers. And uh, we always like to ask, you know, what was that process like in working with AWS? And if you could go back to, you know, when you were in the seat three to four, five months ago, uh, where you were evaluating cloud providers, what would be kind of the advice you would give to yourself uh, if you could go back in time? And I'm not going to say hindsight is 2020 in 2020, but uh, <laughs> what would that look like? Um, what would be the advice you'd give? All right. Um, okay, so I've already touched on a couple of areas that we were looking for, a um, couple of key requirements. So the first one is security of data, because we're not dealing with, um, while we're not dealing with people, we are handling uh, individual level data. Um, also globalization, uh, due to the portability of our product, we're able to ship internationally from day one. So we needed a solution that could handle that. Um, flexibility because we're starting off with a small data set, but as time passes and demand increases, that data set will grow. And so we needed a solution, again, that would handle that. Um, and as we just talked about before with the APIs, we're looking for a solution that could adapt and was not reliant on all of the co components belonging to the same ecosystem, but could talk to multiple ecosystems easily. Uh, so after we looked at those features and evaluated them, we found that AWS was a good fit for us. Um, so in terms of advice for other people, I'd say think long term. Um, start with your um, ultimate goal in mind. Uh, build from the core of your product and then work your way out. Don't just think about the next step. Think about step 10. I think that's great advice. Um, and I'm kind of curious, because your, your solution includes both a hardware component and a software component, kind of how long did that all take? Can you give us kind of a sense of what does it take to develop the hardware piece versus the software piece? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, it's been a long road. Um, the physical device has been in development since 2016 uh, and uh, there's been a lot of um, improvements over that period of time as technology does change quite rapidly. Uh, but it will be launched commercially in May next year uh, at Beef Week in Rockhampton. Um, the other part of the solution, the data platform, has been in the works since uh, late last year. Um, and we'll also be ready for commercial launch in Beef Week in 2021. You guys Very have cool. accomplished so much already. Uh, so I, I'm almost hesitant to ask this, but I have to ask, what's next? Where do you go from here? Yeah. Well, well, I think, interestingly, we're actually being pulled into the world of wildlife monitoring. So believe it or not, we already have customers who will be deploying tags on many of what I would describe as sort of the charismatic megafauna. So these are things like elephants, giraffes, rhinoceros, uh, and, and zebra. And most of this work is being done for pure uh, research and conservancy efforts. So they want to study and, and protect these endangered species. And by tagging and learning more about them, they're going to be able to do a better job of that. Uh, the flip side of that coin is that we probably have an equal number of, of researchers and customers planning to tag pest species. So these are invasive feral species like feral pigs, wild dogs, um, in certain countries uh, introduced pest deer and, and camels. And these efforts are to better understand their movements and how they're interacting with both native wildlife and domesticated livestock um, and what sort of impact they're having. And, and again, develop a better plan to manage those animals. So very similar technology to the livestock tag just being applied in a new sector and in a slightly different and exciting way. Oh, that's so cool, really cool and super interesting. 
Yeah, yeah, Sorry. I agree, Karen. No, no, I, I completely agree. It's 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 really cool to see that shift and to hear about what's going on. Um, now I have to call this out because I am a crazy dog lady. Uh, Karen knows this about me. Recently, there was a press release that came out about Sarah's tag in conjunction with CSIRO's Data 61 about companion collar for pets. Um, so this is huge for me. As I said, I'm a crazy dog lady. Can you tell us a little bit more about this upcoming technology? Absolutely. We love talking with pet parents of all kinds at, at Sarah's Tag. So when we started in this space, um, I was really, when we first started looking at a sort of companion animal collar or, or a device for pets, I did was doing some preliminary research and was really shocked by the statistics in that a third of all uh, cats and dogs in, in the US go missing at some point in their life. And of those missing animals, more than 80% are never found or never returned home. So I just immediately felt that, that animal loss, animal wandering, animal theft, was happening at, at far too high a rate. So we really wanted to start with the, the original insides of our, of our livestock tag, but we needed to make it more suitable to companion animals. So we're working to make it smaller, to make it lighter, again, with CSIRO and, and Data61, and we're working to change the way that, that it operates. So we'll be introducing a new communication package. So there'll actually be two modes of communication for, for the device, um, allowing it to monitor your, your pet when it's in the home, but also detecting when it leaves your house or your yard and is wandering or become lost, and it will activate the GPS and the satellite, informing you of where your pet is so that you can, can, can relocate it and then be reunited with it. Um, we're also bringing in some exciting new technology from outside of that partnership, uh, which will allow us to monitor both the, the breathing or respiration rate of the animal and its heartbeat. So combined with all of the additional accelerometer insight, like how much they're running, scratching, eating, drinking, walking, lying down, we'll start to build a, a really a really holistic picture of an individual pet's not only physical well-being, but also mental health. So we can start to monitor things like anxiety or separation anxiety, and the remote piece really plays a major role here. You're not so worried about your, your animal's anxiety when you're standing right next to it. It might be when you're at work and your, your pet's at home. And that's when you want to have some insight into to how it's coping or how it's handling the day. I'll be following this progress for sure. <laughs> no, it's really interesting just to think of all of the data points that you would have about your herd, exotic species, obviously, that's a really interesting use case. And obviously into companion pets, you know, I, I get very excited about hearing what the opportunities could be, and the ways that you could change your practices. I think it's such so impactful, love the connection to sustainability, rumination, um, so many, so many use cases. So thanks for talking to us about what you're up to. Um, we're going to turn now to questions that have been popped into the chat here and see what our viewers have as questions for you. All right, just a second. Sorry, I'm not fast enough to read at the same time. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> How is the, what is the battery life? How is the connect to, the connection uh, supported from battery perspective? Um, and there's a question, is that a solar recharge re capability? Yeah, I'll, I'll grab that one. Um, so uh -huh. yes, there is a solar panel on the back of the tag. Um, if, uh, Lewis, would you be able to hold up the tag again for us? Um, and the solar panel um, allows the battery to be uh, recharged throughout the day um, all the time. So the solar panel actually means that the battery life can be 10 years or more of the tag. Okay, we have a question. When you said, Lewis, that it lasts for the life of the animal, what can it be reused after the slaughterhouse? Sorry. Uh, no, so no, it cannot. And, and a lot of that uh, relates to some of the mandatory and accredited identification programs that we're working to be a part of. So there's an international accreditation body for identification devices, ICA, and in many countries around the world, there are also national schemes. And part of those programs dictate that the animal has to be identified uniquely. So one unique number around the whole world, no one else can use it. 
and the device cannot be removable and must be tamper evident. So from a corporate and social sort of responsibility standpoint, we have made sure the device is recyclable so that it is collected at the slaughterhouse and actually broken down into its components and repurposed through a standard uh, sort of e-waste recycling route. But the tag itself cannot be taken off and put on a new animal. So a lot of it's to do with the mandatory ID programs, also a bit of a biosecurity risk moving tags around between animals. So we just want to avoid any of that as well. That actually ties nicely into another question here. Um, okay, so I know you had brought pictures along of some of the exotic animals and I'd love to kind of show them and I'm gonna tie it to Rachel's uh, desire to see the Bull Olympics. Um, <laughs> That's right. What, how do you know how fast and one of these exotic animals is supposed to be able to accelerate? Like, how do you, is that kind of part of the insights platform um, and or can you is it being used for like things like poaching um, or movement that you wouldn't expect for a wild animal like geofencing? Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump on this one. So a lot of it has got to do with benchmarking. So you can benchmark an animal against itself, its own behavior over a 24 hour period or like a rolling two week average. And as you start to build your data set, you can benchmark an animal against a herd or against the historical information you have. So most of the work that's being done is, is to try and combat poaching. So the people we work with are highly concerned about the security of their data. So we have to work very hard and probably implementing additional layers of security to protect their information. And, and they don't really want to share it or collaborate it with anyone. It's, it's highly confidential information. You can imagine if the bad guys knew exactly where the white rhino was in, in a con conservancy land area, it makes it much easier for them to engage. So we work really closely with the researchers and conservancy parks to make sure we're meeting their needs. Those photos are so cool. It's, it's breathtaking to, to see them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, uh, I've paraphrased a few questions there. Sorry, I did not call out handles for those that have watched before. You know that I am terrible at handles. So mm -hmm. I took Matt's questions from the chat and paraphrased them with a few uh, other commentary items. Um, but thanks, Lewis and Heidi, for joining us today. That was really helpful. Exciting to see what you were building. Really exciting to see the connectivity pattern that you're able to leverage and the partnerships that you've built. So thanks again for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. Bye. See ya. Bye. Thanks. All right. Well, was, so cool. let's get started on our field tips and tricks. So your tip for today is all about reInvent. Our annual customer conference at AWS is free this year. So there's no excuses not to go. Uh, so the only barrier now is your time. Your tip is to go block off that time on your work calendar and get signed up for some of our reInvent sessions. Right, absolutely. And the last episode we had Joe Flasher on and he will be giving a talk on December 3rd. So shameless tip is to go and watch his talk um, because it is all about earth observation and agriculture. Uh, so if you are searching the agenda, go for WPS 210. Um, if you're searching the event guide or you can search by Joe Flasher. So it'll be a really interesting talk. That's my biggest tip of the day. <laughs> and if you were just waiting for that opportunity to get AWS certified, there is a global challenge for that. And we're not even to the challenge section of the day yet. I know. And you can sign up for the AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner Path. And there is a new Twitch series, which is the AWS Power Hour Cloud Practitioner. And I know I actually watched the AWS certifica Certification Quiz Show for the Solutions Architect Associate path um, when I was prepping for my certs this summer. Uh, and Rachel, I know you've been doing uh, prep for your certification studies too this year. Any tips or tricks that you want to share about your studies? I would reiterate to watch all the great content that we have uh, through AWS, like the certification quiz show is a great example of that. And then just practice tests, practice, practice, practice tests. <laughs> <laughs> 
I love that tip. Just keep practicing. <laughs> yeah, um, just keep practicing. I love it. <laughs> Okay, so we're doubling up on our challenges today, which is kind of super selfish in that we're challenging you to do uh, personal development as well as making an impact. Um, but we really believe that agriculture is the place to be to make an impact um, on the climate in really positive ways. There's so many innovations that enable us to um, do more. The more that we know, the more that we can um, be active participants in the climate. And that can be everything from the varieties that are being developed to adapt to the changing climate conditions and the growing degree units to the indoor environments and controlled environment egg that's happening um, to solve challenges in food deserts. So I you probably can guess this by watching all of our episodes, but I am just super proud to be an egg um, and be part of what is possible. So let's move on to the Make an Impact Challenge. Agriculture has a significant impact to sustainability. We talk about this all the time, and we have increasingly had customers ask about the Climate Pledge and how they can be a part of making an impact. Since we know so many companies in agriculture are approaching the challenges of climate change and sustainability from water management to methane capture, to precision agriculture, to fewer passes across the field to reduce soil comp action uh, to indoor agriculture environments. The list goes on. We want to make sure that you're aware of programs at Amazon that are related to the climate pledge. Absolutely, because in this new virtual world, I don't know about you, but I feel like there's so much content being created. Sometimes it's hard to find the content that connects to what you want to be able to do. Uh, so we really wanted to bring forward some of the programs um, and specifically call out how to make an impact on climate and the alignment with Amazon's commitment and funding. That's right. And Amazon has introduced two funds, and one of those is the Climate Pledge Fund, which is investing $2 billion to support the development of technologies and services that reduce carbon emissions and help to preserve the natural world. And the Right Now Climate Fund is investing $100 million in reforestation projects and climate mitigation solutions, of which agriculture is a great fit. Yeah, that's right. Agriculture includes forestry and fishing at AWS. So we are really passionate about how you can make a positive impact in agriculture and on our environment. Absolutely. And often agriculture is a multi-generational uh, business. So let's figure out how we can leave the earth in a better place than it was when we found it. You know, it just kind of feels like the perfect segue into leaving the earth better for our babies, of which <laughs> you are about to welcome a new little baby girl into this world pretty shortly. I am. I am. So Rachel, I just wanted to say thank you so much for co-hosting the first six episodes this season. Um, we're all super excited for your baby's arrival. So when she gets here, we're expecting pictures. Of course. And you know, I have loved co-hosting and I'm so sad that I won't be able to be a part of the last few episodes of the season, but um, I will be making a special guest appearance on the Thanksgiving episode because I really can't miss an episode that's all about food. I feel like that's going to be a fun guest cameo. I can't wait to see what you actually have done because they wouldn't let me see it. I wonder yeah. if there's jokes involved. <laughs> um, but I'm really excited. We're going to have wine. We're going to have turkey, milk, butter, cheese, all things dairy, veggies, because that's important for our health. And Matt, I think, said is going to be bringing pie. So I'm really excited. Um, plus, we're going to talk about some fun Alexa integrations and facts you need to know about all the food that is getting to your table. So regardless of what your Thanksgiving looks like this year, we are going to have fun together on November 25th. It sounds like a great episode, and I do love pie. I mean, let's be honest. I love all food, but I'm excited to see the pie <laughs> that Matt <laughs> I know, right? Um, um, but yeah, exactly. Thanks again. Really appreciate uh, your co-hosting and we'll see you on our very special Thanksgiving episode. It will be on a Wednesday, not a Thursday. So mark your calendars, November 25th. 
Thank you so much for joining everyone. And thank you as always to our fantastic moderators, Matt and Nathan that are working hard to get you all the links that you need and to answer questions. Um, and as always, stay tuned for the next episode of All in the Field. AWS Agriculture Live.